Man, I'm just like, been, I've, how, how many, have any of you guys heard of Tim's story? Tim's story. Look him up. Tim's story is why, I, one of the many reasons I got saved. Of course, the Lord saved me, but um, I, w- I went to a service of Tim's story, and it was like 3,000 people, and I had never been to any meeting like this, like a Christian meeting, and he's like, everybody stand up. This is the presence of God. Snaps his finger, and everybody falls out, all 3,000 people. <laughs> And I'm like, what the heck was that? <laughs> and my cousin who was by me, she was like totally partying and crazy. Well, we both kind of were, but she was worse off than that. Was, you know? <laughs> but she like fell and she hit her face and she was like bleeding. She didn't even notice. She was like in the glory. She didn't even know. She was just like, what? You know, all happy and excited. But um, I don't know where that came from. But I was thinking about um, Tim's story. I, be- I was watching him like, over and over and over and over again. I just, I mean, I've been following the guy for 10 years. Um, when you watch it, there's impartation. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you will walk in what you choose to, like, feed yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, and I just want you guys to know that, like, when you guys are listening to the word, there's something taking place. <laughs> and whether you're even hearing it, your spirit's receiving. That's right. It's a spirit transaction that takes place. You know? So, I felt like as I was watching him, I'm like, God is calling, like, more people to rise up to walk in this level. It's not about the one anymore. You know, we've heard of a lot of these generals, these guys that operate in signs and, and, and wonders, like, really strongly, but it's always, they've, a lot of them have fallen, and they've fallen, like, <clears throat> bad. You know, like A. Allen was found dead in his hotel from alcoholism. We had John G. Lake who passed away. A lot of them, and I think it's because they've been, they've been pushing and going forward on their own. But I feel like God in this season is raising up multiple so that it wouldn't be about the one. It'd be like groups of us going out and doing this stuff, you know? That way it doesn't become like a one-man show. There's accountability. He sent the disciples two by two. And I think it's for that reason. Side note. So John 1. <laughs> in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God. Um, we're going to do a little bit of Greek because that's what I like to do. Um, in the beginning. The word beginning is the word archomai. It means original, authentic. The root word is the word ark. It means the first person or thing in a series. Isn't that amazing? That in itself is like, what? The first person or thing in a series. In the beginning was the word. The first of many. The original. The authentic. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the God was, and the word was God. He was w- with God in the beginning. It's like a riddle. In the beginning there was... And we'll keep going. And all things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. And in him was life. And the life was the light of men. The word light there is truth. I know I'm poor writing, sorry. And in him was life, and this life. So this life that was in him was the truth of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. I was reading this over and over before I came to class, and this has bothered me, and it just like clicked for me as I was reading it today. Listen to that. Verse 5, and the light shines in the darkness. Is that not present tense? The light shines. It's currently shining. And the darkness did not comprehend it. Is that not past tense? 
And I'm like, why did he do that? <laughs> because the darkness has already been overcome. And the light is still shining. <laughs> right? And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not past tense comprehend it. The word comprehend actually means overcome. Remember we talked about David and Goliath last week? It was like this war that took place, but the victory has already been provided for. All Israel had to do was what? Run. Run. Ephesians. Or sorry, John 1.18. We'll keep going. I love this chapter. We'll just... Uh, actually, let's start at 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt... The word among is actually the word in, in the Greek. And dwelt in us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received. That's like a verse you need to have highlighted in your Bible received and grace for grace for the law was given through Moses but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ notice that the law was given but grace and truth came the law was given it's not it's impersonal you know it was like handed but drew, grace and truth came it came to you it pursued you you know what I mean it's like personal it like and notice that grace and truth is on what side? The side of Jesus. And no one has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father. He has declared Him. And the word declared means manifest. Who is in the bosom of the Father? So I wanted to talk to you about this place real quick, about the bosom of the Father. What do you think of right away when you hear the word bosom? This is going to be like an interactive class. A woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's close. We're getting there, a little warmer, okay. <laughs> bosom, come on. Being in the bosom, a hug. Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> okay, somebody wrap up Ricardo. <laughs> the bosom of the father. Like the first thing that comes to mind for me, I mean, in any mom is probably holding your baby. It's, oh, speaking of baby. <laughs> um, he's like, yes, I want the bosom, okay. <laughs> the bosom is this place of intimacy. You know, it's this place of like, of adoration, right? Any mom, when you re first received your child and you held them, you held them at your bosom, what did you do? You adored them. You just were in awe. It's this place of like just rest and, and complete adoration and love and, you know. And so the Lord is saying that Jesus was in this place, in this place within the Father, the bosom. And I wanted to read to you some scriptures. Ephesians 1, 4 says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. He chose you in Christ before the foundations of the world. You were found in Christ before you were lost in Adam. He saw you in Christ. Think about it. God was like, if we are his image and likeness, then in making us, what he was doing was like a self-portrait. He was like so inspired by himself. <laughs> Hello, that's amazing. Like he's like so like, I'm going to make me. <laughs> I'm going to make more of me. Not that you are God, okay? Like, don't, the same type, that you would be able to reflect who he is. And not a lower quality of him either. You know? It had to be of the same type, of the same quality. And um, we'll get into that later. Or maybe I should just do it now. 
Hold on. The Lord explained it to me like this. I was like thinking about 1 Corinthians 13. I can remember the day that I was reading this passage and things just started to make sense for me. 1 Corinthians 2. Ooh, we both hear Holy Ghost. Check that out. <laughs> Verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages or our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That's amazing. They would not have crucified him if they would have known. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But, but, that's a big but, you should circle it in your Bibles. But God has revealed them to who? Us. Through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. And, he, and the Lord, when I, I remember reading this, he was like, who knows you better than you? Like, you only know what you think. The spirit is the only spirit in Christ know what the, God the Father thinks. They all have the same mind. And so what he does is he places his spirit in us so that we would come to know his thoughts the way he knows his thoughts. This is why he goes on to say, now we, have we, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us. And what is the purpose? He just said it. So that you may, so that you may know the things that have been freely given to us by God. So what is the purpose of us knowing the spirit? or knowing the thoughts of God, so that we would come to understand what has been freely given to us. These things we also speak, not in words which, meet, which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. You should go around circling all the butts in the Bible. That'd be really good. Because <laughs> we probably just know the beginning parts and not the butts. It's just saying, but. <laughs> I say this because we have access to the mind of God by the Spirit. And the purpose is so that we would come to understand what he's, he's provided for us. I forgot where I was going with that, but that's good stuff anyways. John 17, 21. These are just scriptures that I'm reading. That they all may be one as you, Father, and me, and I and you. That they all also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. All these scriptures, the Lord is revealing that he wants union. That, he wa that the whole purpose was union. And if Jesus is at the bosom of the Father, then that reveals that he wants me to be in that same place. Right? He wants us to be in that place of intimacy with the Father where we're, where we're just being adored. Romans 8.29, it says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined, the word predestined means appointed, to be conformed, having the same form as, having the same form as another, that's what the word means, to the image of a son, that he may be the firstborn among many brethren. Does that not make sense with this? Right? He predestined you so that what? To be conformed to the same image as Christ, so that there would be what? Many brethren. So that there would be more of him. But we're going to see this. We'll keep going. 1 Corinthians 1.9. Let's go here. You know that there's only... You, you have one calling. This is our calling, 1 Corinthians 1 9. God is faithful by whom you were 
called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. What's your calling? Fellowship. But look at this. It says, God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of his son. Of versus with. What's the difference? Put your hand down. You know how to answer. You've been telling my classes. With, think about it. If I have fellowship with Michelle, with Jacob. Right? We could have fellowship with Jacob together. And I'm, what I'm doing is I'm participating in the fellow, fellowship with you both. But if I have the fellowship of Michelle with Jacob, that means I'm having the same type of quality of relationship that she has with Jacob. Does that make sense? It's of Michelle, of his son. What he's, what he's trying to say is that you're participating, that you have access into the same type of fellowship that Christ has with the Father. And are we not one with him? So it makes sense. If we're one with him, that we should be able to enjoy the same type of relationship with the Father. And we're going to get that from the next word. The word fellowship here is the word koinonia in the Greek. The word koinonia, if you guys have your, well, some of you guys do, or some of you don't. Um, it's this word in the Greek. It means to share with one in anything. It means participation of the same type. So koinonia, it actually means to share, it, in the Greek it means to share all things in common with. So this fellowship, is it, to, to partake in the fellowship of Christ is actually to partake in all the same things that he partakes of the Father. He wants you to experience the same type of quality that the, he has with the Father. That's why he came. And this is, oh, that's where I was going with that. But the whole mind of Christ thing. And I'm like, why do I have the mind of Christ? And I came to understand that. And the Lord gave me this picture. I was like laying in my bed. I was in Memphis, Tennessee. And I was like, oh my gosh, I, I can know the mind of God. And I was like freaking out in my room by myself because I like got it. And I'm like, what the heck do you do with that, you know? <laughs> um, and I'm like, but, but why? Like, why, why, why did you do that? And the Lord started showing to me like, Melissa... Imagine this earth and it's just you and all the animals on the planet. Some of you have heard me say this, right? It's just me and all the puppies and cats. Maybe not any cats, maybe just puppies. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just me with all these puppies. I could love the puppy and the puppy could love me, but could that puppy ever love me the way I love it? No. Why? It's not of. Sharon, you are brilliant. <laughs> uh, because it's not of the same type of species. It's not the same type of being. So God in making man, he made man in his image and likeness so that he would have a being that was compatible to him and that would be able to reciprocate the love that he is. You could, not, you could contain the love of God and express the love of God completely without any hindrance. Your flesh would become God's opportunity to be. Your flesh would be God's opportunity to be seen. God in eternity entered time through, human body, through the human body. Yes, bottle drop, like <laughs> crazy. Think about that. And people are like, oh, you're saying we're God. No. The branch and the vine. What is the branch? But the life is within the vine. But if the branch is connected to the vine, the branch will bear fruit and the life of the vine will be seen through the branch. 
right? But the branch bears fruit. The branch is where the manifestations of the life within the vine are seen. We are to be where people encounter the manifestations of the life of God. We are meant to be that. To be the expression of God on earth. We'll keep going. Watch this. John 12. Everybody go there. <clears throat> See, like, you, this should make, or it shouldn't make it force you. I'm not saying it like that. But, like, to me, when I heard this, I'm like, I can love you back. I can love you back. Everything that you've given me, I can give back to you. You know what I mean? So like freely receive so that you may freely give. We could touch the heart of God. <laughs> As I was sharing with the students this morning in, in prayer, like you know that each of you have this place in God that only you can touch. You know, my spiritual mom, I don't agree with this anymore, but it's a beautiful thought, so I'll just share it. <laughs> would tell me that she imagined um, she imagined God's heart like Swiss cheese. And it's like all these holes because of all these people that haven't returned back to that place within his heart. And he will, that, that heart will, will remain with holes in it until they choose to return. And if they never choose to return, no one will ever fill that space. He would rather be empty than try to put somebody there that doesn't belong there. He is like that. And you are like that. You are that unique to the heart of the Father. Just know that. That should bless you. Like, man, I remember when she told me that. Sheila would tell me this. She's like, Melissa, I want to, I want to, have you ever been in that place where you want to, like, touch the heart of God? And she would tell me this with, like, tears in her eyes. And I'm like, I want to now because look at you, you know, like, wow, you know, I want to love the Lord like that. John 12. 23. John 12, 23. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. So put your finger there and go then to Ephesians 2, 5. I love the turning of Bible pages. It makes me so happy. We'll start at verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Let's read that again. John 12, 23. But it, but Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most surely I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground, it dies or remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Hebrews. You guys don't have to go there. I'm just going to read it. Hebrews 2.11. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Do you see what's happening? The grain of wheat did not abide alone. It produced much fruit. Who does he say, who did he say died with Christ? Right? Who does he say was made alive? Us. And who was raised up? Us. And who sits together in heavenly places? Us. It wasn't just Christ. He, you co-died with Christ and you co-resurrected with Christ and you are co-seated in heavenly places and you are co-heirs with Christ. The seed did not abide alone. It bared much fruit. Watch. Isaiah. Just like in Bible zone right now. Go to Isaiah. How much time do I have for now? I wasn't planning on teaching any of this, but... Hmm. Isaiah 55, verse 8. 
For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. But, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. But, for, or for, as the rain comes down, as the rain comes down and snow from heaven and does not return there, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be. It shall go forth out of my mouth, and it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing which I sent it. Doesn't that sound a lot like John 12? That the seed would be sown, and it would bear much fruit. Christ was sown so that there would be many sons brought to glory. You know that the reason that people were to tithe is that there was a curse in the land. So there was 10% that was supposed to be sown so that the curse would be removed off the other 90%. Jesus was the tithe. He was the 10%. He was what was sown so that the rest of the 90% the could have the curse removed off them. It was a type and shadow of Christ and what he would do. He would sow himself to redeem the rest. And then my time is about to be up, so I just want to go through one more thing. It was, um, the, the scripture is Hebrews uh, 2.10, for it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. I love that. Isn't it interesting too, it just says that he was made perfect through his sufferings. It's because he redeemed them. Genesis 1, and this is uh, the last section of the book. Ah, yeah. oh, the baby's asleep. Thank you, Jesse. Everybody say, thank you, Jesse. She, she's the reason I can teach right now. Genesis 1, um, and we'll just kind of skip through the verses. 111, I just want you guys to see this. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. Verse 14. Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons, and for days and years. Verse 20. Then God said, Let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures. Verse 24. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind. Verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image. I want you to notice that every time God was going to create, he spoke to the environment in which that, that thing was to live in. When he wanted stars, he spoke to the sky. When he wanted sea creatures, he spoke to the ocean. When he wanted animals, he spoke to the land. When he wanted herbs, he spoke to the land. But when he wanted man, who did he speak to? He spoke to the environment in which that thing was to live in. Yeah. And when it came to you, he said, let us make man in our image and likeness because we were meant to what? Live and move and have our being in him. He is the environment in which you've been called to operate and live from. He is the source of all your life. Everything. This is for another class, but just to share this as well. Every day had an evening and a morning. Every time that he spoke a day, he said an evening and a morning, an evening and a morning, an evening and a morning, until it came to the Sabbath day. When he created the Sabbath day, like I just want to go into a whole other lesson right here, but when he created the Sabbath day, it was the only day that had no evening, no morning. Why? Because it was never meant to be a day. It was meant to be a place. 
The Sabbath is a place. It's a position in which you live from. Rest was never meant to cease. It was never meant to be this momentary thing. We are to be living in a place of rest. When did God rest? When he saw his image and likeness in man. So when do we rest? When we discover his image and likeness in one another. Then will we stop fighting with each other. Then we will finally be able to be at rest. You know that God rested not because he was tired? God doesn't get tired if you guys didn't know that. He's God. He rested because he was content. Because he was satisfied. You know? Francois, our friend uh, who wrote the mirror translation, if you don't have a mirror translation, buy one. I would recommend it. Just buy a new one, too, because I've given all my <laughs> away. <laughs> um, I was like, okay. Um, Francois was sharing this story. He used to do like uh, well watching tours. He lived in South Africa. And um, he took this famous photographer out to sea to take these pictures. And he had like all these huge cameras. And he was like, you know, all prepping and ready. And it turns out that this guy would sell one picture. And one picture would be enough for a whole year's income. That's how much money he would make off these pictures. And so he goes in out to the ocean and he's like getting his camera ready and he's out there taking pictures and they're out there and he's getting these shots. And finally, Francois said he like screamed and he was like, ah, oh, you know, and it's like, that's it, that's it, all right. And he starts packing up his stuff and starts putting everything away and he's like, all right, now we can relax. And Francois said, that's the rest that the Lord into into. It was a rest not because he was tired, but because he got the shot he needed. He saw man, and it was like, that's it. That's it. He's perfect. Let's make a Sabbath. A place where forever we will be able to enjoy what has been created. Notice this. That God did not make man first and have man help him to create the rest. He made all of creation so that all men had to do when he awakened was experience that which was finished for him. All he could contribute was what? His adoration. All that we can contribute to God is our adoration, is our enjoyment of what he's already done. Think about this. The first Adam was not yet, he was asleep. Creation was built, Adam wakes up, and all, everything's done for him, and all he has to do is respond and to enjoy so it is with the second Adam. The second Adam, and what is our job now? To do the same. To enjoy and to experience all that's been completed for us. It's a finished work. Thank you, Jesus. It's all done. You'll be at rest when you come to realize that reality. Like, get it really deep inside you. But you said in others. Yeah, in yourself and in others. I mean, you have to see it in yourself first, you know. I could see God in, you know, all the people. I think it's almost harder to see it in, in yourself mm -hmm. because we're so hard on ourselves, you know. I think it's like this, I don't know, weird thing. We, we battle with loving people, and it's out of lack, really, what it is. Instead of out of our completion. It is only out of completion if you're satisfied with yourself first. You know what I mean? If not, that, lo that love is out of a place of lack that you're trying to attain something back. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is you're actually sowing debt. Mm -hmm. Instead of seed. Yeah. Because you want something in return. Mm -hmm. You know? My spiritual mom would always tell me, like, Melissa, just know I was going through a season where I was trying to leave a church. I just wasn't happy there. I felt, like, really burdened, and I felt like I wasn't doing enough. I wasn't doing enough, and I, I kept feeling like the, the, the ministry just putting pressure on me. And I told my spiritual mom, like, I don't know what to do. And she said, Melissa, what's happened is that these pastors, this leadership has, um, they're expecting to reap where they sowed instead of what they sowed. Does that make sense? 
They're like, we gave you this role, we did this and we did that, now you need to return it back to us. But that's not how it works in the kingdom. You may not necessarily reap where you sowed and you shouldn't be looking to reap where you sowed. You should always be looking to him to return to your harvest. There is a harvest, but it comes from the Lord, not from the individual. Thank you, Father.